Hello and welcome everyone to uh, 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 doo -doo -doo. how do I sound? We're just going to do a sound test before we get go going, guys. Here, uh, Madeline, how do I sound? Do I sound okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We'll get going. Get going just a second, guys. Just got to make sure. I had a problem with my headset a minute ago. So, Madeline, we sound good? Perfect. Okay, excellent. All right, good deal. Uh, I want to welcome you guys all to another full hour of q and I, I love doing these. If you guys have seen me do it before or you want to see me do it, uh, you know, the, the ones that I've already done, I think this is – we're going on the fourth or the fifth, Madeline. Madeline is uh, – helping to moderate. She does our social media. Um, you can go to our YouTube, the main channel, and you can watch some of the ones that I've done before. So I just love doing this. You guys have great questions. I love answering them. And we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We're going to do a full hour of Q&A if you guys have enough questions. Uh, Madeline wrote, yes, it's the fifth. So the fifth week that I've been doing this. So um, we've been doing right for 20, going on 21 years, though. We're almost ready to drink, I guess, because I'm 21 years old. Not that I'm a big drinker, but anyway, um, let's go ahead and get get started here, guys. Uh, to, to, uh, Luke, we, I thought I could have swore we had this question last time, but um, Luke, maybe you weren't on here last time. So Luke said, how would you sell an idea to the government? Well, you, you license it to the contractors that then sell to the government. So if they're making... Um, some sort of, let's say, something you wear, and you, you're going to find companies that make products that uh, you wear, fatigues, et cetera, and you're going to license to those companies because you know that they are the contractors that sell to the government. Could have swore we answered that one last time. But um, let's see, next one. Let's see, we go here. Uh, Sat beer. Um, Let's see what you're saying. I think I've annoyed a seriously interested licensee to the point where they no longer reply to emails. They say they would reach out to me when they had something to show me. Um, and that process takes time, but I sent them a follow-up email every three weeks. Okay, that's not an unreasonable period of time. Anyway, because I wanted to be polite, a polite pest and keep on top of their pile should I have waited for a few months? Um, no, I think that what can be annoying is if you're not um, identifying what the next steps are, you're asking what the next steps are, or offering your help, more importantly. It, I know that you are hung up on this and this. Can, is there anything I can help you with, with this? Just following up, just following up to see if you're ready to do a deal or something annoying like that. That can be annoying. But um, I don't think following up everything three weeks at beer is unreasonable at all. I think that um, is a reasonable period of time, but make sure you're offering help. Can Is there something I can help you with? Or you're offering, you're asking for clarification. What, when should I expect to hear back from you? Or I know you're doing this and this, do you need some more time? Being um, not just saying, when are we going to do this deal or stuff like that? It doesn't sound like you did that at all. Um, but no, waiting months and months with no communication, that's not good. If you're following up every three weeks, it's fine. Um, I think that people are busy and sometimes when people don't know what to do, they just don't do anything. Like they kind of liked your idea, but they got three different managers giving them a lot of different work and you're not their top priority. I think that's one thing that I, I got to help you realize you are not their absolute top priority. And this is something extra on all the rest of their work. So, you know, at some point, you know, what he said was they said they would reach out to me when they had something to show me. Well, I don't know what that means. Something to show, are they working on something? So without all the information, um, I would ask for clarification on that when they had something to show you. Um, you know, you can, you can ask for a little bit more clarification there. Um, draw, drawn us. I need help licensing ideas. Do you guys just coach? 
us and we do everything on our own? Or do you guys call companies for us? We absolutely coach you, but I would never use the word just because our students, um, I was just talking to a student. She was talking about renewing. She's like, I could have never gotten through this without my coach. Um, but we are going to ask you to reach out to companies on LinkedIn and call companies. Now, I don't know why you think you can't do that. I think it's common, though. I think it's very common that inventors feel like that they can't do that. Hold on. Let me check, change a setting here with my audio. Okay, there we go. Um, so I think it's very common that people feel like, oh, these are big companies. I can't talk to them. Who am I? Why would they talk to me? And that might be how you, be, be how you feel, Dronas. Um, they might also, you might also as an inventor feel like, um, I'm, I don't do sales. I don't want to do that. It makes me nervous. But the thing that we always tell our students is you're asking permission to send your sell sheet or to send them a link to your video. You're not selling. So drawn us, if you really, if you literally only had to cut and paste the template that we gave you, which is what we do for our students to via LinkedIn, I think you can handle that. And if you're calling on the phone, you're just asking you know, permission to talk to the marketing manager. And if they give you an email, well, then you'll per send that person an email with your with your sell sheet. If uh, you need to get permission from them, you'll get permission and then you'll send it off. You don't need to ramble on the phone. So the thought that you need somebody to do that for you is incorrect and nobody will be as excited about, about it as you. And if you do it, you know what really happened. So don't look for somebody to do that for you. Otherwise, you'll end up with these invention promotion companies which will claim to do it all for you. And then a year later, you have nothing to show for it. So don't, don't, you got to do it. I'm sorry, man. It's not that hard. It's just work. Um, if I can't, this is from SL, must be a handle. So I'll just call you S. Uh, <laughs> if I can't search PPAs, how do I know that someone else hasn't submitted a PPA for the same idea that I have? You don't. And it doesn't matter. So in all the years we've been doing this, we've never had a student. This is a question we get all the freaking time, and I've never had it be an issue. It could be an issue, never has been. Possibly could. So file a PPA, start contacting companies, make stuff happen. I was going to say something else, but we're going to keep it clean, right? Um, ben says, when submitting short videos of your product to companies, is the recommended method for sending them a link to a YouTube private or unlisted video? And if so, which one is preferred? I love that question because I love, I always tell people this, always, always unlisted. You're like, oh, but Andrew, I want to keep it private. Kind of makes sense. That's what they call it, private or unlisted or public. Those are the three types of videos. So with a public video, anybody can see it. That is the last thing in the world you want when you're licensing your product. You don't want people to be able to look up and look at your product and see your product. You don't want to make that public disclosure. So do not do that. Now people think, oh, private. But here's the problem with private. If you make it private, you have to have the other YouTube user's name, which if you're talking to a marketing managers, they don't have a YouTube user name quite often. Or if they do at home, they don't know what it is. And so you don't want to make it private because you would need their YouTube username. Then you have to go through these hoops to give me your YouTube username. Most of them are going to have one and then I'll share it with you privately. So unlisted is essentially the way I like to look at it is password protected. There is no password, but literally only people with the link and it's a bunch of random letters and numbers and, and signs and things. Only people with the link can see it. So that's essentially a password. And you want them to be able to share it with other people in their business, but you're going to send that privately. So it's unlisted. If you're going to upload a video to YouTube and share it with a company, you always want to make it unlisted, never public, and private's just not going to work. That's going to be a mess. You're like, oh, can't you see it? And they'll be, like, they'll be like, no, we can't see it. Well, what's your YouTube username? And it's like, don't ask a company that. Give me a break. Um, so great question, Ben. Um, make it uh, unlisted, an unlisted YouTube video. Uh, Constance, hello, Andrew. And oh, by the way, there's some great things you can do when you when you upload a YouTube video. You can look at the stats. You can look at the analytics and you can see who's looking at it because, you you know, you'll say you got 20 companies. It's not like you're going to get thousands of hits, nor do you want that. 
Um, but when you see that, oh, it's in Georgia, I keep seeing that this somebody in Georgia has been looked at this 10 times. Well, you look at your list of companies and you see that there's one company in Georgia, you're like, I know that's them. It's not going to tell you it's specifically them, but you know geographically, you know, if, if there's three companies in the exact same geographic region, it could be any of those three. Um, but you, I think they get even more specific than the state, maybe the city, and you could figure it out. So that's beautiful, guys. That's a great tip. Um, Constance, hello, Andrew. Can I start sending short videos or sell sheets to companies? I don't know, Constance. Can you? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what? So I'm, the way I'm going to answer that is, are you ready to do that? So if you've thoroughly studied the marketplace, you've looked at the micro category of your invention, that's one thing we're always talking about. So if you're doing a, um, let's say, a, a kitchen spatula, you should know every kitchen spatula on the market, which doesn't take long. You should really know how your product fits in. You got to do all that first. Then you got to make your you get, you you don't file your provisional first. That's the last thing you do. So then you want to um, make your your sell sheet or your video, and then you want to make your list of companies. There's other things along the way, like should I make a virtual prototype? Should I cannibalize a product? How do I how do I do the marketing in these marketing pieces? But you you got to have a sell sheet. You got to have a list of companies. You have to study the marketplace. You don't just jump in and start calling companies if you don't understand the other products in the space. Because if a company can look at your product and, and find that exact same product in under a minute on Google, you didn't do your job. And if you don't have an improvement to whatever out there exists, and a lot of inventors do that. Inventors file patents doing that because patent attorneys won't study the marketplace. They don't think it's their job and they want to sign you up for a $10,000 patent. You know, And so you got to study the marketplace. Got to make a sell sheet, follow your provisional patent, make your list of companies, start reaching out to companies. So Constance's question was, um, can I start sending out short videos and sell sheets to companies? And my answer is, I don't, I don't know where you are with things, Constance. But if you got all these things done and you filed your provisional, yeah. But you got to make sure your sell sheet or your video is good too. Um, I like doing what's called the laptop test. And you, you find your a friend or family member, you put your video or your sell sheet on a laptop. It has to be, absolutely has to be somebody that you've never shared your invention with before. So it could be somebody else other than your friends and family if you already shared it with them. And you just spin the laptop around, you let them play the video, or you let them look at the cell sheet. You say nothing. If they ask questions, you just smile. You say nothing. And you see if they're confused. You look at their face and you see if they're confused. If there's a lot of confusion, you know you have some work to do. So this is a very cheap way of doing some research to see without having to pay some marketing person or something, right? And the vast majority of the, the, the time, the average inventor, the sell sheet the, the, or the video, it won't be good enough. So it needs to be that good. So that's the other thing, Constance, that I would do before you start reaching out. These are good questions, guys, really good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Aziz, Aziz, Azizi, okay. Uh, what if I can't find any companies to sell to? Well, then you got to move on to the next project. But my guess is most inventors, most of our new students, when they come on board, if they have looked for companies, it's an anemic list. Um, it is, say you're working on a kitchen gadget or automotive product, and the student will typically have two or three companies. The really easy, low-hanging fruit right in front of their face at a local store since they found online. It's usually the biggest ones. And then the coach is like, oh, well, given your product, you could look here, here, and here in this way. And, you know, don't limit yourself to just these types of companies. You could find these company companies making this and this over here. And now the student, after they go out and look for those, they come back with 20, 30 companies. I'm not kidding. So, if you have 20 or 30 companies, you have 20, 30 chances for success. If you have two or three, you have two or three chances for success. So it's easy, you know, I, I guarantee you that there are potential licensees, companies out there that can license it, you can license the product to. You just don't understand how to find them. So 
Um, and without knowing your product, I can't guide you specifically. That's like a specific question. Um, uh, Jen, what are the first steps a new inventor should take to get started? What industries would you strongly recommend for newbie inventors? Uh, I, I'd say that most industries are good. I mean, I can just, I would say most industries are very good. Uh, and when I rattle off a few industries, I always worry like, well, then those are the industries I have to do. No, I see this all the time. They get these bizarre different industries that I've never heard of. And I'm like, yeah, that's very viable. So um, I could, but I can just say off the top of my head, some categories a lot of our students are in. Um, they're in uh, kitchen, home storage organization, things for storing. Um, and organizing your home. Um, garden is a big growing category, pet, um, automotive. Um, but then you can get into industrial too. So any consumer product, any consumer product category is a good product category. You can get an industrial too. Um, I've had students that did license like giant drills and different things that drill into the earth. Um, it could be a scalpel, like a medical device. Um, could be a disposable uh, medical product, some sort of wrap or bandage. Um, uh, you know, somebody said earlier, I have an idea I want to sell to the government. I said, well, you license to the contractors that sell to the government. So you can, you can license all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I, I talked to somebody about this earlier today. With licensing, you shouldn't be asking them to start a new business. So you're tapping into what's already there. You're tapping into their money, their workforce, and their existing distribution. So your product is another one of 50 of their products that they already have. So if they're doing dog toys and you got a new dog toy, great. They're just going to plug it into that machine and they're going to they're gonna, um, sell it just like another one of their products. But if you're like, oh, well, you should sell over here and you should do this and that, and it's not even remotely what they're doing, and you're basically asking them to start a new business. So I give you an example. Um, talked to somebody the other day, and they wanted every product to have be custom with a monogram on it. And I'm like, well, a company isn't going to make if they're selling mass market at Walmart or Target, they're not going to start monogramming each individual product for the person. Now you're asking them to start a whole new business with a whole new distribution channel. So again, like I said, with licensing, you want to tap into what exists already. Don't ask them to start a whole new business. I mean, it could be a new product, but it's got to make sense for their existing business model. Don't ask them to sell somewhere completely different than where they sell. Don't ask them to manufacture completely different products that they don't make. Like you're, uh, they're selling dog toys and you're selling, you're saying, well, you should make iguana products, you know, products for cages for your iguanas. Well, that is, you could call a company and they remotely might, that might work. They're like, well, we never really wanted to get into reptiles, but this is very intriguing. We might get in with this. So you could do that stretch, but more than likely you're going to be approaching a company that already makes products for reptiles because that's the business they're in. So that's only a little stretch, but it's a complete stretch to say, I want you to monogram and customize each one. Well, that's not what they do if they're selling mass market, right? That's too much of a stretch, okay? So that was from, uh, so, so Jen asked, what are the first steps a new inventor should take to get started? What industries would you strongly recommend for? An so I, most industries, what I can tell you, Jen, is for a brand new inventor, uh, some industries that are really difficult that I'm not saying you shouldn't invent in, but are really difficult. So one is software. Everybody and their grandmother, like I said, I think last time has an idea for an app. But if you don't have the software background, it's going to be difficult. But for a software developer, there's no difference between licensing a dog toy and an app because they can talk intelligently to the software geeks. Software geeks go, well, that's all great, lady, but it's going to take, you know, six guys in a room a year to program, and you can't talk about what the back-end database is and stuff, and that's going to be not good. So if you had a, an idea for an app or a software product, but you also had an idea for um, a kitchen gadget, work on the kitchen gadget. So for software, fine for software developers or people with a software background. So that would be one industry I would avoid, Jen. Um, 
But the other industry that's difficult is the packaging industry, which most of you don't have packaging products. So like a toothpaste tube or the package something goes into. Our other co-founder, Stephen Key, he's been in packaging and we help our students license packaging products, but it's really difficult industry. You have to have a lockdown understanding of manufacturing. Then you have to lock down the intellectual property around that. And then the companies are really, really big. And they're selling like bazillions of units are flying off the line because it's the packaging stuff goes in. And they're much harder deals to close. So if somebody said, I got a packaging idea, a dog toy and a kitchen gadget automotive product, I probably direct them to work on one of the ones other than the packaging idea. But we have people that are like, no, I still want to do it. I know it's more difficult. So the only two industries I can think of that are really difficult are um, software and packaging, which most of you guys aren't in. Well, most of the other industries are, are fine, Jen. But it, it is nice. And the other thing that I will say that will make it easier on you is you might not know what industry you want to go into. You might have a couple products and a couple different industries. So you try one product in um, kitchen and you try another product in medical and you start to get a feel for each of those. And you're like, wow, I really like medical. It's fun. Or I really like automotive or whatever it is. And then when you approach 30 companies, let's say it's an automotive product and you work on your next product, maybe 10 out of those 30 are appropriate for this project number two, and you've got their email, their phone number, and you ask them when they weren't interested in project number one, hey, can I send you more? So I have this, and they're like, oh yeah. And you can literally just then email them. So what I'm saying is when you stay in an industry, you make relationships and you don't even need to call them up anymore. You don't need to LinkedIn message them. You can just literally email what your new product is and remind them of who you are, that I said, you said I could come back to you. I'd sent you this before, what have you. So there's a lot of benefit of finding an industry you'd like. It's going to be different for everybody. And uh, I mean, I have one student that's licensed, I think, four or five um, lawn uh, sporting good games, like lawn toys or sporting good games. This is like a little niche industry and that's his thing. And he's got his companies that he's made relationships with. And so, but your first product is the opportunity to make those relationships. So if you approach 25 companies and 23 weren't interested, you've now made relationships with 23 companies and you want to ask them all, are you open to more ideas? And then you have another product and you just plug it in. So you guys aren't one trick ponies. You can keep doing this for the rest of your life. So there's really beneficial in staying in industry, but maybe you play around with a couple different industries at first to figure out which ones you like. Um, and if you're using our approach, you know, quite often for a lot of products, you're spending less than 200 bucks. You know, you're spending 70 bucks on a provisional, a few bucks on a sell sheet, and you're, and you're showing it to companies and seeing if there's interest. So you're not blowing 10 grand on a patent and five grand on a prototype, and then you don't have the bandwidth to move on the next one. We have a lot of students that have done, spent a lot of money, they come on board with us because they know we'll make sure they do and say everything right, and they've invested so much already. But then they're like, I know, Andrew, I, I'm not gonna do that again. I've learned from you guys watching your YouTube show, and I'm not gonna make that mistake again. And so it is an asset if you license the product, but it's a serious liability if you spend tons of money on a project and it doesn't work out. And like we always say, Steve and I are a broken record on this, but you're not selling your, your prototype or your patent. You're selling the benefit of your idea. That's what you're truly selling. So sell it. See if there's interest. Companies won't kick you to the curb if you don't have everything all lined up. And if they want to put it back on you, great. At least you got some interest now. But to spend 15 grand not knowing if there's any interest just because you love your idea and you're sure that it's going to work out, you should never be sure of anything. You want to be you want to be conservative with how you spend money when you're licensing. Um, not so cheap that you don't spend any money, but be conservative. Okay, Michael says, uh, this is a question we get often. What is the best way to value your idea so you don't sell yourself short? So it's whatever you can get, you know, but when you, the value of your idea is going to vary depending on the company you approach. So one company may be a medium sized company and we teach our students to ask a lot of questions of the company to gauge what they can do with the product. And then you can run the numbers. Like I always say, 
the three things that the three factors that people think it's just the royalty rate. What royalty rate what I'm getting? But it's three things. It's the royalty rate, the price of the product, and the volume being sold. So those are the three numbers. With those three numbers, you can calculate what your potential royalties are. So you can get a 5% or an 8% royalty, and people get obsessed about that. But if you get a 5% royalty and the company is going to sell very, very, very little volume and the product's 99 cents, we'd be like, oh, I don't think I'd be happy with this deal. But if they can do half a million units at 99 cents and you're getting a, maybe they only want to give you 4% royalty and you're like, damn, that would add up to a lot of money or it's a $60 product. But that's how you run the numbers. You calculate the royalty rate and then the cost of the product and then the volume being sold. So, um, you know, to evaluate your product, you don't really know what it's worth because it's worth a different amount of money. You'll be making a different amount of money depending on the company you you, you approach. So you approach them all, and you don't you don't overthink it because you can never know. You can't read their minds, and you need to figure out what they're going to do with it. You're going to hold them to it in the licensing contracts. So if you decide the deal is too small, you don't do it. If you're like, damn, like if they they can do that amount and you're going to hold them to it in that licensing contract, I'd be very happy with this deal. So, um, and to, you don't want to evaluate it too much up front. If they're in stores that you want to be in, they're qualified. You try to get all those deals on the table and you'll, you'll get one or a few or sometimes none. And then you evaluate what they can do with it. It's only worth whatever they can do with it, right? So to think like my product, I mean, this is like some cheesy Shark Tank show, right? Um, th th not licensing isn't, but you're not going to, well, uh, you approach them, well, I valued my product at so-and-so. Well, you're not raising venture vulture capital, so you don't need to do that junk. And it, it's a complete and utter waste of time. So nobody can put a value on your invention until you've talked to a potential licensee and figure out what they can do. And then we can help you evaluate um, or you can evaluate that on your own, what it's worth. So it's really great questions, guys. Um, really rock. And thank you, Michael. Great question. Um, let's see. Uh, Albert says, have any invent rights students teamed up? I believe I have some great ideas in many different industries, but I have other responsibilities taking my time. Um, I'll be honest, you, I, we've had some great teams, husband, wife teams, father, daughter teams. It was really weird. We had two father, daughter teams where one father, um, they were both around late 40s, early 50s. And one um, daughter was 12. And on another father, daughter team, I think the daughter was seven. And they both closed um, deals within like three or four weeks of each other. And so father, daughter teams, husband, wife teams, friends teams, um, I, I've found that they can be very beneficial. At the same time, finding a random inventor that you don't know very well and having two inventors work together, that's a recipe for disaster because they're always going to be more interested in their product than yours. And, you know, and so if what you're looking for, what we really believe who is uh, who is asking this question? Okay, Albert, you have other responsibilities. You have to spend the time, Albert. So, you know, our students spend about two to six hours a week. If you spend the time and you do it, nobody else is going to do that for you. And companies claiming, give us a bunch of money, we'll do it for you. It's going to go all of nowhere. Um, so you have to put aside when you have to find the time to spend two to six hours a week and do it yourself. And then you'll know exactly what's going on and you'll become empowered with the skills to do that the rest of your life. If you look for somebody to do that for you, you're just gonna find an endless list of shysters. Um, so so I, I'm, you might not like my answer, but you're gonna have to do it, man. And it's not a big deal. It really isn't. And But it's gonna be some work, but keep it in perspective, guys. This is one one thousandth the amount of work of starting a business. You're just trying to get a deal on the table, close it, and then it's all on them. Now, I'm not going to try to make that seem super simple because it's still work. So you're reaching out maybe 25, 30 companies and maybe two show interest and one falls off. You do a deal with one or maybe they both fall off. You got to keep calling more and then you get another one like four or five months later. 
that's the work you got to put in. So Albert, don't look for somebody to do this for you. Um, the idea is maybe five, if 10% of it, the rest of it is the 90% of the work that you put in. Um, and once you get used to it, I've noticed that our students that work on their second project, it literally goes two to 10 times faster once they get that experience. But don't, don't look for somebody to do it for you because they don't, I would say they don't exist. There's people that claim to do it, but I've, I've never met an inventor that went to an invention promotion company in 20 years that had, that had an invention promotion company license the product for them. Not once. I personally have not met an inventor. What does that tell you? But we talk to people every single day, at least one, that's been taken for 10 or 12 grand and nothing happened from it. So we firmly believe that about empowering inventors. And if I had to use one word to describe what InventRight is, it's empowerment. Whether it's watching our YouTube show, or reading our books, or becoming a coaching students of ours, we're all about empowering. And we do not cater to people that don't want to do the work. Sometimes people just need to watch us ramble for a while. Maybe th this is helpful. You know, you know, Andrew's breaking this down. I think I can do this. You know, and it's all very real. But I'm not going to tell you it's not going to be any work because it is. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Courtney says, is there one particular thing that would make you confident during market research for your potential idea that you should move forward with the idea? Um, yeah, I'll say something weird. If you find a bunch of stuff that's somewhat similar, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, because it proves there's a market. And so when you approach those companies and other companies that are making stuff in that space, they're like, oh, yeah, we know that and that and that sells. And, oh, he's got this tweak. He put a hinge on the side that offers this. So when people look at, let's say, three other products on the shelf that are in the same space and they look at ours, a percentage of people are going to buy ours. Not everybody's going to buy anything. OK, everybody will want it. Never say anything like that. There's nothing like it. Never say anything like that. But so. One uh, indicator that it's a good idea is if, if you realize there's things in that space and then you've got a, a slight tweak to it. Companies really like slight tweaks because it reduces their risk. They know those other products are selling. It proves the market. And then you've got some sort of improvement. And with that said, I say that and then people go, oh, but mine's completely new. There's nothing like it. And every single time, 100% of the time, I can show them there's something like it. There's nothing exactly like it, but there's other products that offer a similar benefit. That is something like it. So that's fine. So don't think that if there's not a ton of stuff very similar to it, that that's a bad thing. It's not. You can have really different products. But does it make sense? Um, so she, uh, Courtney is saying, when you're doing your market research, um, are there indicators that you can that you should move forward with the idea? Um, you know, finding things that are somewhat like is also an indicator like, oh, they, they can do that. And then my tweak's just a slight tweak. So that shows your, that's your manufacturing research done. You know, that's nice. You don't have to go out and get quotes and everything. Um, I would say that if the product is simple, that's a big plus. So, you know, the company can look at it and go, oh, yeah, we can make that. So they're just evaluating it on the benefits of the product and they're, they don't need to do a whole bunch of research to figure out if they can do it. That's a big plus. But our students license complicated things, too, that require in-depth research. If you can have some of those answers, that's great. But um, you can just get the fish on the hook as well. So let's let's move on to the next one. Thank you, Courtney. It was great. Um, oh, wow. Uh, the Speak Easy is their handle. Oh, it says, hi, my name is Chris. Chris, great. I like that better, Chris. I have four scheduled calls with companies that are interested in my product. That's that's rocking it, Chris. That's great. Scheduled calls. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I like that as well. You know, when you get interest from a company, the very first thing that you want to do is get on the phone with them. Most inventors love to go back and forth via email because they're afraid to get on the phone. You want to get on the phone um, with them ASAP because now you're a real person. You're not just an email. And um, it shows a pretty serious interest from them, the fact that they took the time to get on the phone with you. Anybody can drop you an email and ask you for this or that. It doesn't require much of any effort in their part. It takes a little bit of effort 
for them to get on the phone with you. I think that's a great thing to do, Chris. So you have four scheduled calls with companies that are interested in your product. What should I expect and what questions should I ask? Um, you know, that's it really depends on your product, Chris. You know, I, I can't really answer that specifically. I can give you some general stuff, but you you need to understand their product line. You need to understand your product. You need to understand your product might fit in with their product line. Um, you know, one thing that I'll say is that you need to guide these conversations more than they will. And this goes for all negotiations. Um, you're guiding it way more than they are. So our students, when they get interest, they'll get on a pre-call with our negotiation coach, Paul, and Paul will say, what are all the things that have been discussed before? So that's what I would say, is you need to take all the look at the things that were discussed before or were emailed before and be prepared to address those issues. But you also, more importantly, you need to guide the conversation. So you need to ask them what they like about the product how they see it fitting in with their product line. It's a really beneficial to get them talking about the product and get them um, actively engaging, not just in their brain, but with you. And now they've been interacting about it. Now there's, I know it's just a phone call, but there's a certain sense of moving forward and some sort of commitment there. And that's a great thing. So the most important thing you can do is what you're already doing, Chris, is just get on the phone and establish some rapport. The average negotiation from the time one of our students gets interest, because I asked our negotiation coach, Paul, to the time a deal is closed is three months. So the most important thing I can say to you, Chris, is don't even remotely attempt to get it all done in this first call. The important thing that you're trying to establish here is quite frankly that you're not a wacky inventor. So you don't need to be a, come across as a captain of industry, but you need to be easy enough to work with. So that is huge. When you get on the phone and you're not saying crazy stuff, you're not you, you don't you don't negotiate prices or royalty rates or any of that on that first call. But they need to know like I'm not going to get embarrassed by introducing you to somebody else in the company or being on a call or sending them something that you sent me. Um, so just being easy enough to talk to, um, but you don't need to come across as a captain of industry by any means. You just need to be easy to work with. If they get the sense on the very first call that you're going to insist that this product is red, God damn it. And there's no way it could be any other color. And you start to like, get into those debates or you get into weird conversations like that, that's going to be a red flag. They could love your product, but they don't want to deal with you. Um, you need to be easy enough to work with. In some ways, you're not selling yourself. You're selling the benefit of your product, but you are selling yourself in that you need to be easy enough to work with because most companies, they're not going to put your face on the package. You know, they're going to license this product and, and then they're going to sell it. And so um, I think the most important thing I could say for a first call, the most important thing you could do is to establish rapport, come across as easy enough to work with. You don't need to be super sharp or anything and have some questions ready to ask them. And some good questions are, you know, what do you like about the product? Do you have concerns about the product? And usually it's easy for an inventor to focus on the product. Focus on the product. Get them talking about the product. You shouldn't be talking about royalty rates or any of that. Now, they might want to know, well, what are you looking for? And so I'll give you a great tip there. You say, well, I'm looking for a reasonable uh, royalty uh, per unit. So when you guys make money, I make money. Of course, their knee-jerk reaction, most people will say, I don't think I know how to snap my fingers anymore. Um, so most people will say, what would that be? And you say, well, it, it all depends on what you're going to do with the product and to understand what you're going to do with the product and understand your company a little bit more. I'd be happy to send you a term sheet at the right point at some point. But I'm just looking for a reasonable. So they know you're not asking for a quarter million up front, that you want to get paid on the back end. As they make money, you get paid your royalties per unit quarterly. So it's okay. You And because sometimes you get a market manager, they don't, they're like, so you want to like, become our partner? What do you do? And you want to stay away from all that. And you want to stay away from saying the words selling your patent. You're never selling your patent. Okay. Never, 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 never saying, well, I want to sell you my patent. So, you know, and you never want to talk about doing an outright um, sale either. Don't even bring those things up. You mucked it up if you do that. It is your fault for bringing that up. But, you know, realize that a lot of these companies, they have no formal process. 
So the marketing manager doesn't really know what to do with you. So just create the rapport as on and on the first call, yeah, this guy's easy to work with and talk about the product. Okay. If they ask you, what are you looking for? Just say, I'm looking to do a licensing deal where I get paid when you guys are successful. A small royalty per unit. You don't have to say what that is. Okay. I think that was pretty in-depth. That was a good answer. Um, let's see. Uh, Sherry, do you have any advice for reaching out to a patent owner that hasn't made the product for whatever reason? I want to add something, get it licensed and split royalties if I can get it done. Yeah, you know, massive numbers of inventors and companies file patents and they never do anything with it. It's crazy how many inventors file patents. They never make a single call to a single company to license it. Or if they, they make some really weak attempt, I want to sell you my patent. Like I said, never sell it, say that. Um, and they're like, oh, I guess that didn't work. They, they think that they're going to file a patent and the world is going to be a path to their door. So you can approach, you could approach, it was Sherry, you could approach these inventors and you could get them to sign something that says, if I get a, you have to have an attorney do this. I'm, I want to license your product. I have an improvement. I'm filed a PPA on the improvement and I want to license this and I want to give you a percentage of it if I'm able to do a licensing deal and I want a year to work on this. And, you know, th there'd be two responses to that, two major responses. Um, if a person has been sitting on it forever, the patent, they're like so excited. Anybody's calling them about the product whatsoever. They're jumping, jumping up and down going, yeah, 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 that's interesting, you know. And you, you're saying like, I've, I, I know how to license. I've been doing this for a while. Or if you, if you have, don't say that if you haven't. But just say, I, you know, this is what I want to do. And then you get the other inventor that suddenly now this idea is worth a million dollars. The 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 average inventor that files a patent and they filed it very recently and you know it was just issued like you know six months ago they're more than likely to be unreasonable than the one that it's been sitting there for five years you know so that's just a little a little tip but somebody that's had it for a long time they could be unreasonable as well um, but here's the thing you know we teach our students to come up with all the variations and put that all into their provisional patent and if they later license it to put all that into the patent as well. So we teach our students to think about all the workarounds, variations, improvements, but a lot of inventors aren't doing that. So I'm not saying you're working around other inventors, but if you see a patent and you know, really take a look at it, because most of the time you can go right around it because this is why you're like, oh, well, people can get around me, Andrew. I'm like, no, that's not usually true. Um, the reason why most I've heard IP experts, intellectual property experts, say up to 80% of patents are weak to garbage. And the reason for that is people go, oh, I came up with an idea. And they go to an attorney. They go, this is my idea. And here, patent it. And the patent attorney, what they should say is, well, you need, me to give, you need to give me all the variations, workarounds, improvements, so I can really give you great coverage. And a good attorney will do that, but a lot of them don't. But it's on the inventor too. The inventor should say, here's my idea, but here's all the variations. Here's the other versions. 80% is good, 100% is good, but not the vision, version that I'm pitching. And please include all that in the patent. And so the question for you, Sherry, is if you take a look at the patent, can you just get right around it? Because most patents you can because inventors haven't done that. Our students don't file those types of patents, but huge numbers of inventors do and huge numbers of patent attorneys don't care because they know the inventor will not do anything with it because inventors file patents and sit on them all the freaking time. The vast majority of patents are filed and they never do anything with it. Um, so see if you can go around it. No reason to get mucked up with another inventor wanting a piece of it if it's not necessary if you because that's a new invention they didn't cover it that's perfectly fine and perfectly ethical if you go around what they're protecting um, because you're trying to license your invention it sounds like you came up with an idea and then you saw somebody that had come up with something similar when you did a patent search now it complicates things so you might just go oh, i'll work on another idea well, i don't need to get his permission but see if you really do look at read through those claims um, Uh, 
Okay. So the original bar back, is it difficult to create a brand? Do you have any basic suggestions for creating a marketable brand or brand name around their series of products? Thank you. Um, you know, when you license to a company, they have their brands. You're, you know, and it's, it's not usually your product, they're going to brand it under one of their brands. I mean, they're going to see if it fits in. They're not going to launch a whole new brand necessarily. Now, it can have a product name, but when you say a brand, they're usually going to make it fit into their brand uh, or one of their brands. Um, now, I, I remember I had this uh, French-Canadian student, um, and he licensed a, a product. Uh, or it was actually an entire line of eight camping products. And they showed he, he showed the company one. They loved it. And they show us another one, another one, another one. They're like, we want to license the whole line of eight, which is this is not common, guys. Um, and they they liked his brand and they licensed it under that brand and they launched a whole new like line. That's not normal. Um, most of the time they're gonna make it fit in with their, their brands. So um, and a lot of times they're not gonna use your product name. So, but you know, if you can make it kind of well first off when you're licensing i'll just call you original um that's your, that's your screen name um when you're licensing you you want to tap into what's already there so you want to tap into their existing brand and you can make that your branding fit in with that one company but you're not going to do a different sell sheet for all 20 companies. That's not very practical, is it? But if you do make it kind of look like their brand, that might get their attention. But if you have 20 companies, and you need to make a different sell sheet and do the branding different for everyone. Kind of make it look like something that's in that industry. And so my worry for you, Original, is that you think that you're just going to try to license to one company. You shouldn't even be working on a product if you only have one company to license it to. Don't do that. It's a waste of time. Um, so, but my when our students think they only have one, the coach will talk to them and they'll realize they have 20 or at least eight or 10 or 12. It's very rare. There's only one company, very rare. Um, Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Okay, Spencer, if a company is interested, how do you ensure you can continue to reach out to other companies while they determine viability? I'd hate for them to sit on it until the PPA timeframe runs out. You don't. It, that's the biggest mistake that inventors make, Spencer. So if you have 20 companies, it's like a shotgun blast. You get it out to all 20 companies at once. So just imagine, you know, you get interest early on, you're excited and you you really like you're like you're like these are my guys, right? And they go back and forth with you for 2 months, which is normal, and they say, "Ah, oh, you know, we decide we're not interested for these reasons." You're like, "Oh, damn. Okay. Call four or five more companies. Get another one interested." You again, you don't keep reaching out back and forth, back and forth, two and a half months. Ah, oh, we decide we're not interested. You could drag this thing out forever. So it's extremely normal for our students to have interest from multiple companies. There's no reason to drag it out. You get it out like a shotgun blast to everybody at the same time. And you talk, if you get interest, let's say you get it out to 30 companies and five show interest. You move forward with every single one as if the other ones don't exist. It's very rare that you get them all to a final stage of a contract. Um, and you're like, oh, that could be problematic, Andrew. No, it's a great problem to have, and it's not a problem. And we tell our students to do that all the time. It is not a problem. So do not do one at a time. And if somebody shows interest, you keep reaching out to other companies. The, you have no obligation to them whatsoever. There are certain points at which you might, if they're doing certain things, of course. But if it's just interest, uh, keep reaching out to other companies. Uh, okay. Okay, Michael says, a very specific question, but interesting. I have a utility patent on a pain-free crutches that I use. The problem I have is hospitals order crutches from medical supply catalogs 
and they are manufactured overseas. How do I find the licensee? Well, that's great. So this is a perfect example of distribution channels can be different. So if you have um, a dog toy, you know, you're going to Petco, PetSmart, Walmart, Target, Rite Aid, Walgreens sell a lot of dog toys too, as well as Amazon. So, but if you have uh, a medical product, you know, people are going to uh, medical supply catalogs that hospitals are buying from. So it's pretty simple. You go to those catalogs that the hospitals buy from. You look around at the companies selling not just crutches, but some other things too that are in that space. There might be, because they're in the distribution channel you want to be in. They're in the medical supply catalog or many of them that the hospitals are buying from. It's the equivalent of going to Walmart and going, well, they're in Walmart. They're somebody. They're making a dog toy. I'm going to call them. That's all you need to know. So all you need to know is they're doing crutches and they're in that medical supply catalog. So you call those companies. Now, sometimes in the area like crutches, it can be very generic. Um, so, but you want to call, there's usually an American company that is importing that stuff from China, uh, Michael. And, you know, they may be willing to innovate. They may be like just this boring ass company that imports generic stuff from China and reduces cost. You know, and you'll have to find out. You can kind of take a look at their product line and figure that out. Or they might be like, oh, yeah, okay, we're willing to go outside our regular just buying stuff from China, slapping our name on it. But you're licensing to the American company. It doesn't matter if it's getting made in China. They're probably not Chinese companies. They're most of the time still to this day going to be American companies. Um, but again, you know, you don't limit yourself to crutches. They could be making other, they could be making walkers and they're in those supply catalogs. And they're like, oh, we didn't really want to get into crutches, very price competitive, but you got this innovation. We can charge a little bit more. So people limit their list of companies. Oh, I can only contact people that are selling companies exactly, the, more or less exactly the same thing. It could be in that space, okay? So if they're making walking canes but not crutches and they're in a hospital supply catalog, I'd add them to your list. You know, so that's a good question. That's an example of a different distribution channel that is not standard consumer retail. Um, another example of that is restaurant supplies, napkins, napkin holders, salt and pepper shakers, the million of things that restaurants use, their supply catalogs. So you're not going to, you know, restaurants are going to Walmart to buy that stuff. They're going on these, these sites that sell that stuff. So that's where you look for your potential licensees. Uh, what, am, what do we got? Seven minutes here. Um, Peter says, if you have a product that needs to be produced in vast supply, can you license to more than one company or or will or are they pretty much want an exclusive? So people have this misperception. If I license to five companies, I'll make more money. But some of these companies are so freaking big. One is all you need. And you're, you're not. And it's the same rule that I've been telling you guys. You're not going to license to two companies that sell on the same shelf at Target. If they're stepping on each other's toes, you're not going to do a deal with two different companies for the same product. You know, if they're in the same exact distribution channel selling the exact same product, that makes no sense. Now, it could be a different distribution channel, a different geography, maybe a variation, a cheaper version of the product or a more expensive version. So then you can license to multiple companies. But there's this perception that I need to license this to multiple, many companies. But you can think really big when you're licensing because you can you can think like a big company because you can license to them and then you are them. So in most cases, one company will do it and they do want an exclusive, but it depends. I've had students say, like, oh yeah, you could break that out. You got a industrial version, a consumer version, you got versions for these different markets, but it depends on the product. Um, but for the most part, most of our students are doing exclusive to one company and don't think that you have to do it to multiple companies. It doesn't make sense a lot of the time. Sometimes it does. Um, uh, Nicole says, how long is too long to wait for a company res response? It's been a month. If no good news right about now with what's going on in the world. Um, you, know, you know, I definitely reach back out to them if it's been a month. 
And, you know, it depends. I don't know if you submitted it on their submission page or if you talked to an individual and sent it to them. Either way, I would submit again. What we're finding with our students right now is our students are able to get to companies easier, not harder, because people are paying more attention to their email. They're working from home. They're paying more attention to their LinkedIn. Now, that's not a blanket thing. Some companies are like, hey, no, we're busy. We're just in doing this right now. We're not doing any new products, but those aren't the companies you want anyway. Um, strong companies will do just fine coming out of this. I worry about some of the really small companies, though. They're the ones that are that are going to suffer and have a hard time coming out of it. Um, but our negotiation coach, Paul, he's got as many deals right now as any spring. Um, there might be a four or six or eight month delay in when they launch the product, but deals are getting done and our students are able to get a hold of companies. So sometimes what I'm finding now, our students and our non-students are, are, are they're, they're assuming that everything is because of the COVID thing. And I'm like, your rate of response is this is actually better now for most of our students. So it's normal for companies to give you, oh, not a right match, not at this time, where in the past, that's what they would say, or really cool product, but uh, we're just not, we don't have room for another product in our product line. Um, whereas now they might say, oh no, due to the virus, because it's an easy excuse to give. And for a percentage of them, it's legit. And for other percentage, you're just like, oh, they'll accept that. Anybody will accept that. Um, so be wary of that because we have just as many students in deals right now. They're able to get a hold of people easier, not harder. Doesn't mean that some won't respond. A company not responding for a month is normal, Nicole. People don't follow up enough. Um, so you just need to follow up with them. Perfectly fine. They might have lost it. I mean, they're just busy. You know, it got in their email, went down to the bottom of the box. And you just need to send it again. Um, how much time do we have left? We're running out of time here. Uh, So, you know, CB said, what is a good royalty percentage if you want to license your idea? And like I said, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I don't know if you're here earlier, CB, but um, it's three things. The royalty rate is the price of the product and what volume they can be s selling. So if, um, if you're going to license something that goes on every Coca-Cola bottle, they sell a billion Cokes a day. You could get a 0.00001% royalty and you'd be happy. So it's all relevant. But as a general rule, and don't go like telling companies this because you want to see what they can do with it. And as an inventor, you can really screw yourself up. You just bring it up. Well, I heard Andrew say 5% is common. So I'll just tell him 5%. Don't. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That'll mess you up. Um, but the most common royalty for a consumer product is 5%. Um, I've seen as much as 20, over 20% down to, you know, 1%, one percent, one and a half percent, but it's not the royalty rate that's the only thing. Royalty rate, product, what's the price of the product, and what's the volume that they can sell? Okay, but a common royalty rate for a consumer product is five percent. Um, but there's techniques for communicating with companies. You don't want to bring that up um, early on in the conversation. Uh, you want to figure out what they can sell first. You want to interview them. And so I think we'll, we should, maybe I'll do another question here, but we should leave with that um, before we leave is the biggest thing that I can relate to you guys if you get interest from a company is you're interviewing them way more than they're interviewing you. And if you don't guide the deal along, they'll fizzle out almost every single time. And it was on you as the inventor. You're like, oh, I can't tell this big company what to do. We guide our students to do it all the time, and it works tremendously um, because they don't do licensing all day long. We do. Um, and if you get used to it and you've done a few deals, you can feel confident in doing that too. But people trip out on that. Uh, Yeah, Timothy says, if a company asks for manufacturing costs, is it all right to tell them the quote I received? Yes and no. Um, you know, they, whatever quote you got, Timothy, unless you approached a contract manufacturer and said, look, I need, you know, uh, 20,000 units of these a month or whatever it is to get a decent price. And I represent some other big company. They're not going to give you a good quote. Whatever quote you got is going to be way higher than what they can get. But if you got something, you say, look, this is what I got. But you guys can get a price way down from that. Um, 
but I really prefer that you put it on them. You give them the information about the product that they need so they can get some quotes. Um, but, uh, you know, be careful about sharing your ridiculous quote because you're the, the company's like, oh, he's just some inventor and I don't think we'll get the order. Contract manufacturers will give poor quotes to individuals that they don't perceive can really order in order to make you go away quite often. So hopefully whatever quote you got wasn't a go away quote. We know you're not serious. Um, and you don't want to give that sort of quote to a potential licensee. They're going to be better at costing it out, basically, than, than you are. Um, okay, so we're, we're at 6 o'clock. I had a lot of fun, as usual. Um, I'm going to come on back next Wednesday again, um, same time, same place. You guys had fantastic questions. Um, I hope you liked my answers. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Madeline, for working the uh, the chat. Um, if you just go back to the InventRight YouTube page, the main page, so InventRight TV, and you click on the main page, get there, you'll see the link for the next uh, YouTube. Oh, and I want to remind you that tomorrow we have uh, David Contract is his name, and he is with Baby Breeza. And we're having, because we had um, the week before, last Thursday, we had Trish from All Star Marketing. They did the Snuggie, and they're a dear TV company. We had, they, come, they came on. We need ideas just as much as ever. The week before, we had Hasbro on. They said the head of acquisitions, wow, Hasbro, largest toy company in the world um, uh, by dollars. And they came on. We need new ideas. And so we have David coming on for a baby product saying we need new ideas. So um, make sure to register for that. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, uh, all right, cool. Um, and uh, Madeline put the link right there in the chat. So you can take a look at that. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it guys. I enjoyed it, had a lot of fun. Take care and keep inventing. We'll catch up with you next time. See ya, bye.